Hmm. I think it's going right, Logan. It is okay. Great. All right, everyone. Good morning. Good afternoon. Uh, thank you for being here for this week's fine seminar. Uh, my name is Lauren Hayes. I'll be your host today. A um, couple of quick announcements. Um, first off, uh, let me pull up my screen here, share screen here. Oops. Can everyone see the three speakers? Look good. Thank you. So first of all, I want to thank last week's speaker, um, Dai Shizuka, for a really fascinating talk. And I think it was, uh, was on migrant birds in winter and really great discussion. And it made me, it personally made me think a lot about different ways of thinking about social organisms. And uh, it was a really enjoyable uh, uh, seminar. Um, next, next week, a uh, quick announcement. Um, excited that Joan Silk will be joining us. Uh, Joan will be talking about male parenting and primates in um, particular work on baboons. So it'll be a really exciting talk to hear. And I want to point out what's coming up in two, two weeks. Um, you know, I think the last fine Carson hosted a group of African students, and that went really, really well. It's really great for these students to have exposure in the fine and talk about their work. And this uh, time frame, we're going to have three Latin American students, uh, Sandra Nelson and Selena, will be talking about their research. Uh, the structure will be a little bit different in that there'll be shorter talks. There'll be about 12, 15 minutes each. But it will also have that hour discussion afterwards where we can all engage with these um, really bright, uh, well accomplished students. Today, I'm really excited to um, host Eileen Lacey, who is our speaker today. Uh, Eileen, um, many of you know, is a leader in the field of behavioral ecology and studying social animals. Um, Eileen got her PhD, well, got her undergraduate at Cornell University, and, I, and then earned her PhD at the University of Michigan. And she is now a professor in integrated biology at the University of California, Berkeley. Um, Eileen's research program uh, has, um, you know, I think was groundbreaking in how it sort of integrated the idea of thinking about um, how ecology shapes social behavior. Um, social organization, but she's also looked at things like the genetic consequences of sociality um, and thinking more about sort of vertebrate responses to environmental change, an important field of work, I think. Um, I think one of the, the big things about Eileen's work is that she had this long-term field study with the Tuco Tucos, which we're gonna be hearing about today, I imagine. Um, and, and personally, I'll say that this long-term study was a motivator for the work that I'm doing with Chile. It was a model. When I was in graduate school, I was watching this project grow and develop, and I thought, wow, that looks really cool. And um, it really sort of shaped my career path in pursuing the work with the Degus. But that's not what the only thing she's been working on. She has a captive study of uh, Sonomi's sociobilis that she works on. And as I said, they're getting into vertebrate response to environmental change. She's also studied social behavior in California ground squirrels and has done some work with behavioral genomics. Um, she's been really productive over her career. She's generated numerous publications um, in the range of 100, I imagine, uh, in really good behavior journals. Um, she's been an advocate for the study of mammalogy and has published papers in journal mammalogy and has been a leader in that field, that, that um, society. Um, but her also her work gets into more integrated journals like hormones and behavior and even into some studies that are published in like morphological journals. So she's had an impact across a, a broad range of, of the field. Um, and this is despite the fact that she's been, you know, really active in both teaching and service as well. Um, she's had a big impact on the Museum of Vertebrate Zoology at UC Berkeley. I've noticed on her website, lots of outreach projects with um, middle school kids. Um, and has taught a number of courses, including freshman courses, animal behavior, behavioral ecology, and in recent years has been, I think, co-chaired the department um, in, at Berkeley. And so with that, I'm not going to say any more. I'm just really excited that Eileen is with us today, and she's going to be giving a talk 
um, titled An Unearthing Unexpected Diversity Social Structure in Tuco Tucos. With that, I'll stop my screen sharing. And Eileen, please go ahead and yeah, we'll try make to... sure it, it works still. <laughs> It'll just adjust a little bit here. And I trust that what everyone is seeing now is just the slide, correct? Yes, Perfect. looks good. Well, thanks, Lauren, for that very kind introduction. I have to say, the, one, the two words that stood out were groundbreaking only because of the pun involved, as you'll see as I progress today to talk about subterranean rodents that um, I just wanted to say I've been attending this seminar series pretty steadily since it began, and I've been so impressed by the science that has been presented in this group that it's a real honor to now be one of the presenters in the fine seminar series. And I want to thank Logan and the organizers for the invitation to speak with you today and share some of my work. I'd also like to start by being upfront that a lot of people have contributed to the research I'm going to share today. I have an acknowledgement slide at the end, but I just want to be upfront in that there's no way at this point I can list them all. So collectively to all of the friends, colleagues, collaborators, students, park guards, landowners, everybody who has in some way contributed to the work that I'm going to share today, a big thank you. With that, I'll dive in. There are three topics I'd like to cover today. The first is simply to provide you with a little bit of background on Tuco Tucos, that these animals are not generally well known, and I want to share a little bit about them as well as some of the foundational work that I've done to understand their social behavior. I'd then like to talk about one of the foci of research in my lab right now, and that is efforts to understand what contributes to variable dispersal decisions by female colonial tuco tucos. And then I'll wrap up by focusing on some of the work we're doing currently to try and characterize interspecific variation in social structure across the genus that contains tuco tucos. So to dive in, a little bit of background, perhaps start with the question that I'm asked surprisingly often, and that is, what is a tuco tuco? Answers vary. Just last week, I learned this apparently includes a, a character in an online fantasy game. That was a bit surprising, but I'm still learning. It might also explain some of the challenges I've had over the years because I've spent the last 30 years looking for rodents. So I'm, I'm going to focus on the rodents, not the fantasy. As a biologist, if I'm asked, what is a tuco tuco, my response would tend to include the following information. These are rodents in the genus Tenomys, which comprises the family Tenomyidae. This family, this radiation is endemic to South America. It occurs from basically the southern end of the Amazon basin down to Tierra del Fuego, the area indicated in black in this map of the southern portion of the continent. There are currently more than 65 named species of tuco tucos, but the number continues to increase almost every time someone looks. So it's a very speciose genus. And despite this species level diversity, all of the animals are subterranean. All tuco tucos live in underground burrows and conduct the majority of their life activities underground. And as a result, they share a generally similar body plan and morphology that we think has been largely shaped by that subterranean environment, as well as numerous additional physiological and other adaptations that again seem to be associated with life in underground burrows. Now, there are two reasons why I study Tuco Tucos. The first, honestly, is that this cartoon depicts my career goal. This is my dream job. I've long known that I wanted to work in the field to characterize the behavior of species that had not been studied previously. So to me, this is one thing that Tuco Tucos have allowed me to do is to pursue this, this career goal. But as an undergraduate at Cornell, Lauren mentioned I'd been an undergraduate at Cornell, I took a course from Steve Emlin that had very significant impact on my career. And one of the things that Steve emphasized throughout the course was that it was not sufficient to study an animal simply because it had never previously been studied. There needed to be a question or a conceptual basis for working on a particular organism. 
So fortunately for me, while I was an undergraduate, that question began to emerge, meaning the question that made it relevant to study Tuco Tucos. And for me, really, this began with my undergraduate research, which was on naked mole rats. Now, at this point, we all know naked mole rats are amazing. They're incredibly socially complex. They do all kinds of things. We've heard some great talks in this seminar series about these animals. When I was working with them, this was shortly after the first captive colonies of naked mole rats had been brought to the US. And I was working in the lab of Paul Sherman at Cornell to characterize their social structure. I spent a lot of my undergraduate years in hot, dark rooms watching mole rats do things, and the result was one of the first quantitative characterizations of their behavioral division of labor. In particular, we were looking at how non-breeding mole rats spent their time, what activities they engaged in, and demonstrating what's now well understood that smaller non-breeders tend to go out and gather food, gather nest material, while larger non-breeders tend to dig tunnels and to defend the colony against perceived threats. Uh, that was the start for me, and it was that work with naked mole rats that really got me thinking about subterranean rodents and different ways to understand or approach studies of their social behavior. Now, as we all know, again, naked mole rats have an amazingly complex society, but to me, it always seemed that, that the foundation for that had to be simply that these animals were group living. And I expect that a lot of people on this, this seminar would agree with me that the complexity we see, the things that really set naked mole rats apart, are unlikely to have evolved if these animals did not consistently live in groups and in particular in kin groups. So to me, the question that kept growing in my mind was why do naked mole rats live in groups or what are the factors promoting group living in naked mole rats? And at the time, the people working in the field with these animals identified three factors that they thought explained or contributed largely to the tendency for naked mole rats to live in groups. These were soil conditions, food resources, and rainfall patterns. And the hypothesis proposed was a bit more specific as to how these three factors interact to lead to or to favor group living by naked mole rats. But to me, what stood out is that these are three pretty basic ecological parameters. They're certainly things that any other subterranean rodent is going to encounter and experience. I mean, soil, your food when it rains or how it rains or how much it rains, those were pretty general ecological conditions. And I became increasingly curious about other lineages of subterranean rodents and what was going on with them ecologically, particularly if there were other group living subterranean species. So to put that another way, I became interested in looking for convergent examples of group living in subterranean and then asking, were those convergent examples, meaning convergent with African mole rats, were those convergent examples associated with this same suite of ecological conditions? Now, at the time I became interested in this question, there weren't a lot of possible study options. I've already mentioned the African mole rats. That's kind of where things started, and there were quite a few people working with them. The other known social subterranean species at the time were one species of Tuco Tuco in the family Tenomyidae and a rodent called the Kururu in the family Octodontidae. Oh, for a variety of reasons, both logistic as well as um, heuristic in terms of study possibilities, I opted to begin working with Tuco Tucos. Now, at that time, as I'd mentioned, there was only one social species of Tuco Tuco known the colonial Tuco Tuco, Tonomi sociabilis. This species was described in the mid 1980s by Oliver Pearson and Miguel Christie, both of whom have ties to the Museum of Vertebrate Zoology, where I'm based here in Berkeley. Well, it turns out that, to the best of our knowledge, extant populations of this species are limited to a roughly 1,500 square kilometer area in northern Patagonia. As you can see in the map here, my mouse shows up, point of reference is the city of San Carlos de Bariloche located here. The entire known extant distribution of the colonial Tuco Tuco is the area hatched in red, all of which is contained within a national park, Parque Nacional Nahuapi. 
I visited this area. It made the search for a study site relatively straightforward. I visited this area for the first time in 1991 and established a field study site for this species at the black dot located here on the western shore of the Rio Limay, this large river that flows off to the northeast. I have returned to that site almost every year since, the exception being a few years during the pandemic, to conduct field studies of these animals and conduct long-term monitoring of their behavior and demography and ecology. The photo on the right shows this area, the Limay Valley where I work. In the background, see if I get the mouse back, you can see a little bit of the real Limay there. This portion of the photo is the study site where the tuco tucos occur. And in the foreground, you can see our camp where we set up camp every year while we're working in the field. So that was the basic setup. The field methods that we've used are very straightforward, very familiar to mammologists, and honestly pretty basic. We have an annual program of capturing animals. We can capture effectively every animal in the study population. All individuals are permanently marked with a pit tag so that we can follow them from season to season and monitor everything about their, their lives and their life history. And all adults are fitted with a radio collar so that we can monitor them from above ground while they're running around and doing their thing underground. So again, pretty basic workhorse standard techniques in mammalogy. But by doing this intensively over multiple years, we've been able to gather a lot of spatial and demographic information that's been very informative about the social structure of these animals and, as you'll see in a few moments, other species of tuco tucos. Now, when I began this work, although the colonial tuco tuco had been described as social, there really wasn't any quantitative data to support that statement. So a significant number of early years of the project consisted of trying to characterize the social structure of this species, beginning with simply confirming that the animals were indeed group living. They are. Burrow systems in this species are occupied by one to six adult females, so that gives you an idea of the range of group sizes. Burrow systems never contain more than a single adult male. So a group, in a sense, is a series of females and one adult male. Now I want to point out here in this figure one important point, and that is to note that within the population, both in any year and across years, there is a significant percentage of burrow systems that contain only one adult female, either with or without an adult male. That variation is going to be important in a few moments when I talk in more detail about these animals. Second thing, or basic element of social structure that we addressed was the breeding structure. These animals are plural breeding. Our field work is concentrated during the early, well, the austral spring and early austral summer, which is the breeding season for this species. And every female we capture is either pregnant or lactating. So all females are reproducing. Telemetry data indicate that all of the females living in a burrow system share a single nest site, so they're communally nesting. And data from lone females, as well as placental scar counts from a few accidental mortalities over the years, indicate that maximum litter size for an individual female is six pups. But if you look at the graph in the upper panel here, you'll see that in larger groups, the number of pups reared to weaning during a given season is considerably larger than six, again providing evidence that more than one female in the group must be breeding. Interestingly, though, if we look at that on a per capita basis, the number, the per capita number of pups reared to weaning decreases with group size. That's shown in the lower panel in this figure, suggesting that there's a direct fitness cost to living in a group and that that cost increases with group size. So a little bit about breeding structure. The final point I want to summarize is regards group formation. Groups of colonial tuco tucos form due to natal philopatry. The upper table here are data from animals that were first captured as juveniles while still resident in their natal burrow system and then recaptured a year later as yearling reproductive adults. 
Now these are only partial data, it's not the full data set for all years of the study, but it, but it serves the purpose. If we look at the pattern here, almost all males first captured as juveniles, and there always has to be one exception, but almost all males first captured as juveniles and later captured as adults had dispersed from their natal borough system. They were living in a different borough system when recaptured as an adult. In contrast, for females, Roughly two thirds of the females captured as juveniles and later captured as reproductive adults were still resident in their natal borough system. They were philopatric. The remaining roughly third had again changed borough systems between years consistent with their having dispersed between their juvenile season and their yearling season. Uh, if we take that forward now one more year and the lower table here presents data that for animals captured as yearling adults and then captured during a second adult year. You can see the pattern here is, is a little bit, well, again, there's a striking difference between males and females. All, first, not many males make it to a second season, but all of those that did had again moved between seasons, meaning the, the borough system they lived in as a yearling, they were living in a different borough system as a two-year-old. More females survived that second season, but all of them were resident in the same borough system they had lived in as a yearling. So if we pull all of this together, what it suggests is first, all males disperse and all males disperse every year. In contrast, a significant proportion of females are philopatric and spend their entire lifetime in their natal borough system. And finally, and again, this will be important in a few moments, for females, there seems to be a single temporal window for dispersal at the end of their juvenile season. Females don't seem to disperse again after that, that juvenile season. So a little bit, a quick whirlwind tour of some of the work that we did simply to characterize the social structure of this species. And just to summarize that in words, our evidence indicates the colonial tuco tucos are indeed group living. That was good news. They're communally nesting, they're plural breeding, and groups are composed of close female kin. Now, they, you know, these are no naked mole rats in terms of social complexity. That quickly became clear. But they are a group living species of subterranean rodent, and in that sense, fit what I was after in terms of looking for convergence in the tendency to live in groups across subterranean lineages, so as to be able to ask questions about the selective factors, the adaptive consequences favoring group living across different subterranean rodent lineages. So a little bit of background. I'd actually like to shift gears now and move to the second part of the talk and, and say a little bit about one of the major foci of work in the lab right now and that is to understand variation in dispersal decisions by individual female colonial tuco tucos. I just gave you some quantitative information about dispersal patterns in these animals. And just to convert that information into a graphic, we can cartoon the basic life history patterns of female colonial tuco tucos like this. All females are born and reared in their natal burrow system. They spend their first summer in their natal group. Uh, for the females that disperse at the end of their juvenile season, those individuals must find an empty burrow system in which to establish residence. To the best of our knowledge, dispersing females do not join existing social groups. So in other words, a female that disperses from her natal group at the end of her juvenile season will end up liv living and breeding alone as a yearling animal the first time that she reproduces as a yearling animal the following spring. And by alone, I mean without the presence of other related females in the same burrow system. In contrast, for females that are philopatric, and remain in their natal burrow system, those individuals, when they are yearlings breeding for the first time, they will live and breed within a group of closely related females, a female kin group. 
And that difference was pretty striking. And as I'll show you in a moment, seems to have significant implications for, these, for the biology of these animals. But to emphasize, this difference in dispersal trajectories creates very different social environments for yearling females. And the obvious question that we then wanted to ask was, does that difference in yearling social environment make a difference? Is it important? Well, it turns out, maybe not surprisingly, the answer is yes. If we look at direct fitness, we find that on average, lone yearling females, so those living without a kin group, produce or wean more juveniles during that yearling season than do yearling females living within a female kin group. Perhaps in a trade-off with that, however, survival to a second breeding season is higher for the group living yearlings. And I can see already, or I know the question forming in a number of your heads asking about the quantitative trade-off there. The answer is we don't yet know. We finally have the genetic tools required to assign individual pups in groups to specific mothers to be able to ask how all of this plays out in terms of lifetime reproductive success. So hopefully that answer will be forthcoming, but at least you can see on an annual basis, lone females tend to rear more pups during the yearling season, but they don't survive as well to a second breeding season. The other thing that we've looked at with regard to this contrast between lone and group living yearlings is physiological and concerns their glucocorticoid physiology. That in the field, fecal baseline glucocorticoid metabolite levels, or in other words, glucocorticoid levels, um, are on average higher for lone yearling females than they are for group living females. Easy way to think of that is lone moms, single moms are more stressed out. Uh, this has been confirmed in the lab experimentally using experimentally assigned lone and group living yearling females. And the we get the same pattern providing more strength or more credence to the idea that this physiological difference is really a result of social environment. So in sum, does that difference in yearling and social environment matter? I think the answer is pretty clearly yes. And just to remind, and I think that becomes even more apparent if we look at the age structure for the population, which as you can see here is clearly yearling females make up the majority of the population during any given season and across years. So in other words, whatever happens during that yearling season is pretty darn important in terms of individual lifetime patterns of fitness, survival, et cetera. So again, in summary, that difference in yearling social environment seems to be pretty darn important. And to remind you that that difference arises or is strongly associated with the difference in dispersal decisions by individual females. Now, I want to add now a piece of information that that variation in natal dispersal decisions occurs within families as well as among littermate sisters. So by following, again, marked individuals, we have found that at least in some cases, littermate sisters reared together during their juvenile season, one will have, been just, will have dispersed and will be living elsewhere as a yearling, while the other is still resident in the natal group. So again, this variation is occurring in a sense on a very local scale within families and even among littermates. Well, all of this led us to start wondering a little bit more about what drives these differences in dispersal decisions. And certainly my group's not the first to think about natal dispersal in the context of social structure and things like that. There's a long and venerable history of work exploring natal dispersal, natal philopatry and its effects on social structure. Within kind of the construct of behavioral ecology, a lot of ultimate level research has been conducted, uh, some of it conceptual, some of it empirical. I'm thinking just as a few examples, the ecological constraints model proposed by Steve Emlin, follow-up model by Walt Koenig and all the delayed dis dispersal threshold model, recent excellent review by Clutton, Brock, and Lucas, a lot of interest in understanding ultimate level factors that lead to differences in dispersal decisions in social animals. Less abundant, but 
growing in presence are proximate level studies of natal dispersal versus natal philopatry. Um, emphasis has been to some degree on endocrine mechanisms and more recently on differences in gene expression associated with these behavioral outcomes. A couple quick examples. I always think of the classic, now classic, Polkamp and Sherman paper on natal dispersal in Belding's ground squirrels that looked at endocrine uh, factors affecting those dispersal decisions. And again, much more recently, a paper out of Dan Blumstein's group that looked at gene expression differences relative to dispersal patterns in, in marmots. So again, I think interest in proximate level approaches is growing, as are the methods that will help us address that aspect of dispersal decisions. But to me, there's always been kind of an intermediate level that is more at the level of individual phenotypes and variation in what we recognize in particular as the behavioral phenotype of an individual. And there are several terms that are used to describe this behavioral syndromes, personalities, behavioral phenotype, but the variation that we can observe and quantify and document at that level that may be informative regarding dispersal decisions. Well, clearly all three of these levels interconnect. And, and ideally, we would be conducting research that was integrating analyses at all three or all three of these levels or approaches to understanding not only dispersal, but really any aspect of behavior. There are not many studies that have done this. For many organisms, there are real practical constraints that prevent us from undertaking such a comprehensive integrative approach. But there are a few study systems where this type of integrated approach seems to be possible and maybe no surprise, but spoiler alert, I'm gonna suggest the colonial tuco-tucos may be one of those systems. And in particular, the thing that leads me to suggest that, or in a sense, our secret weapon, so to speak, is the captive population of colonial tuco-tucos that we maintain in Berkeley. At this population was established in 1996 from a dozen juvenile animals that I imported from Argentina. They've done extremely well in captivity and currently we have somewhere between 150 and 200 animals in the lab. Too many, but it's been a great resource to work with in terms of, of more controlled laboratory-based research. In the lab, the animals are housed in artificial plastic burrow systems. You can see a little bit of a couple of the burrow systems here in the, the upper right corner of the slide. They're housed in family groups. We imitate the natural demography and group structure of the species as best we can in captivity. They breed annually in the lab during the austral spring, meaning on the same temporal cycle that they follow in the field. And in the lab, an average litter per female would be about four pups with a range of say two to six again. So all very consistent with our data from the field. But we realized in a sense, this was a pandemic born project that because I wasn't able to travel to Argentina for a couple of years to resume or continue the field work and started thinking about what can I do here in Berkeley we hit on the idea of using these captive animals to try and get a better handle on what aspects of individual phenotypes might contribute to the variation in dispersal decisions that we had documented in the field. So a major focus of the lab right now is trying to identify these phenotypic predictors of dispersal. And here I do wanna specifically give a shout out to the person my co-disperser or collaborator on this particular venture, Nikki Lee, who I hope is out listening there today in Zoom land, that uh, Nikki is currently a postdoctoral scholar at Berkeley, and she's been instrumental in getting a lot of this project up and running with me. That starting from the literature, both, both the literature more on the neuroendocrine and mechanistic side of things, and the growing literature looking at individual behavioral phenotypes and dispersal in wild populations, we pulled together a starter list of phenotypic attributes that we thought might be relevant to colonial tuco-tucos. And this includes some pretty obvious things, body size, a tendency to explore novel environments, tolerance of conspecifics. We also compiled a list of more mechanistic potential predictors, things like 
glucocorticoid levels, testosterone, and a couple different neuroendocrine systems. The basic plan is that in the lab, the animals are reared, born and reared in the lab, so we can monitor their growth and behavior from birth up through, certainly through the critical period during which dispersal might occur. We've been focusing on litters that contain two or more female pups so that our comparisons can be relative within litters as well as across litters. When females hit the right age, the age at which they would start dispersing in the field, which happens to be about four months, females are run through a series of behavioral tests. They undertake open arena trials shown here to try and characterize their tendency to explore novel environments and their general activity. They engage in social tolerance trials where we judge or monitor record their reaction to a similarly aged unfamiliar con specific. Um, and then at the same time, we're collecting fecal samples regularly to monitor endocrine levels. After all behavioral testing is complete, we do sacrifice a subset of individuals so that we can look at neuroendocrine correlates of, of their behavioral patterns. So, systems such as the dopamine system, oxytocin, we look at both receptor distribution and activity for these different endocrine systems using a combination of autoradiography, the brain slice here, and gene expression. Now, uh, Great, that sounds cool. It's certainly kept us busy for the last few years, but you might be wondering where does the dispersal factor into this? We've developed a couple different ways to try and assess dispersal tendency in these captive animals. The first is a lab dispersal assay. It's a little difficult to see this photo, but the animal's home burrow system is located over here to the left. There's then this elevated open plastic box that the animals can enter. In the wild, colonial tuco tucos disperse by running above ground, and that's something they're not particularly comfortable doing. This box is intended to imitate that. Animals that successfully cross the dispersal chamber can then drop down into a new burrow system. It seems simple, it seems spatially so restricted, and yet it has been remarkably effective in revealing differences in behavior among, again, even litter mate sisters. This year, in an attempt to be a little bit more realistic, we added a second dispersal assay. This one is in an outdoor series of outdoor enclosures that the Berkeley campus maintains. We set the animals up such that an entire family is run at the same time. They start out in a little plastic burrow system located here and are then allowed for a period of about a week, free run of this enclosure, but to move from the different segments of the enclosure between these different white partitions, have to go through a specific tunnel. That's simply so we can monitor movement using an RFID system. We then have a new or a different plastic burrow system or at least plastic nest box in each section of the enclosure, as well as the animals are free to dig and create their own burrows. And again, what we're monitoring is if the whole family starts out together here in this corner, how do different individuals use that space? How do they spread out? How do they basically self-regulate their use of space? And can we correlate any of those tendencies with the phenotypic predictors I listed a moment ago? So what have we found? Well, as I already mentioned, this, this was foundational, but it was important and it was exciting. Even these simple tests have revealed remarkable variation in behavior among, again, even littermate sisters. So although it seems simplistic, and I convinced, you know, I admit starting out, I was not super convinced that we would find a lot of variability. The behavioral variation has been amazing. I'm going to stop there, and the rest of the results for the moment are remain under wraps. We're currently analyzing the first round of data and aren't quite comfortable going public with it, um, but it'll be forthcoming soon. And in particular, Nikki and I are intending to present the results of this first round of testing at the International Mammalogical Congress in July in Anchorage. So stay tuned, and we hope we'll have some interesting results to report correlating all of these different behavioral and, and other phenotypic predictors of what we interpret as dispersal tendency. So I'll leave you there wondering about that. 
and move to the final part of the talk, which is to say just a little bit about work we've been doing now to characterize interspecific differences in social structure among Tuco Tucos. So when I started working with these animals, the dogma or the conventional wisdom was that all Tuco Tucos are solitary, meaning that each adult occupies its own burrow system. I've illustrated that here in cartoon form where each ellipse represents a different burrow system and each black dot represents the nest of a different individual. This was the expectation, Tuco Tucos are solitary. Well, the discovery of the colonial Tuco Tuco changed that. And as I hope I've convinced you in this talk, colonial Tuco Tucos are indeed group living or social. And in that species, the animals that share a burrow system exhibit highly concordant, almost completely concordant patterns of space use and overlap. Now, in this case, we've defined social as group living, with group living in turn defined based on two criteria. One is that multiple adults or adults share burrow systems and share nest sites. So, okay, here we are, we've added this social species and we now have two quite contrasting pictures of social structure in Tuco Tucos. I immediately began to wonder about, oh, I and my colleagues, I was not alone in this, were there other variants out there? Or what would happen if we began to look more broadly and more comparatively at other Tuco species? I confess I was tossed into this comparative structure pretty early on. I'm going to take you back now to the Limay River Valley near Bariloche, where I started working with colonial Tuco Tucos. You've seen this slide, and you've seen the red hatched areas, the distribution of the colonial Tuco Tuco. What I had not anticipated when I started this project is that the eastern Limay Valley all of this area is occupied by a second species of Tuco Tuco, the Patagonian Tuco Tuco Tonomis Hegai, which our telemetry studies have confirmed is solitary. Now that's a cool setup for a lot of reasons and it's allowed, allowed us to do a lot of interesting ecological comparisons, but the point more for today is that almost from the get-go I was working with species that exhibited these two very contrasting patterns of social structure, one solitary and one group living. And again, it immediately made me start to wonder about other types of variation in social structure if we looked more broadly across the genus Tonomies. So to realize that, and maybe this is me finally returning to my career goal of you know, studying previously unstudied Tuco Tucos in their world, Oh, for the past dozen years or so, at the end of every field season, I've taken some time to go explore social structure in other species of Tuco Tucos. The next stop on this tour was in extreme northern Argentina to work with a population of Tonomis opimus, the highland Tuco Tuco. The study site, or at least the initial study site for these animals, was in a park, Laguna de los Pozuelos, in Jujuy province. Again, this is extreme northern Argentina. You can see Bolivia from our study site. And the animals here, the Highland Tuco Tuco, is unusual in that these animals spend considerably more time above ground than do either of the other species I had worked with. This has practical implications for how we can catch the animals. It also means that we can observe more of their behavior directly. Uh, that's been interesting and fun and has allowed us to do a number of things that we could not do with the other species that I'd worked with prior to this. Uh, what have we found? Quick snapshot, using the same basic field methods, Tonomis opimus is also group living. Adults share burrow systems and they share nest sites, so meeting the two criteria that we've been using to identify group living in these animals. Interestingly, however, this species differs in at least a couple of important ways from colonial Tuco Tucos. First, in Tonomis opimus, it's not uncommon to have multiple adult males in the same social group. And indeed, about 25% of social groups present during each year contain multiple adult males. That's a striking contrast to colonial Tuco Tucos. 
The other interesting difference was that spatial relationships in Tonomis opimus, the animal shown here from northern Argentina, spatial relationships are much more flexible and variable than they are in colonial tucotucos. You can get some sense of this just looking at this graphic, which shows the home range is 95% minimum convex polygons for seven individuals that statistically form a social group, meaning are significantly spatially associated with each other. And yet, as you can see, the individual colored polygons, there's considerable variability in how members of the group interact spatially with each other and how they share nests, including individuals sharing same nest for several nights, but then at least one switching to share a different nest with several other members of the group. Overall, a lot more spatial variability than is typical of colonial tucotucos. Another way to look at this briefly is just to look at how the home ranges of individuals change across years. I'd alluded to in colonial tucotucos, but will now state it explicitly. Females, once they settle in that, you know, prior to that yearling season, they stay in the same place and they're there with very little variation in their social use, or sorry, their use of space from year to year. Looking at highland tucotucos, it's much, again, much more variable. Each graph here represents a different adult female highland tucotuco. The different colored polygons represent her home ranges, her areas of space use across three successive years. And if you just look at how the patterns differ across individuals, you have individuals that didn't overlap at all with themselves year to year others that overlapped much more, some that overlapped in some years, but not all years. Again, just a lot more variability in patterns of space use than I was used to from working with colonial tucotucos. Overall in this species, the highland tucotuco, there's a general tendency for individuals to move to progressively larger groups across successive years. But again, that comes with considerable variation in changes in group composition, meaning that two adults that live together in a group one year may both be living in different social groups the following year, even though both are still alive and still present in the study population. And again, that's something we just never observed in colonial tucotucos. So bottom line, our next effort, the third species I looked at really, was group living, but in a quite different way than what I was used to. And so to return to our cartoon diagram and try to represent that here, we again have solitary as one potential social structure. The social structure that I was used to from colonial tucotucos, and now a third data point that honestly is kind of something in between. And between the two social species, there are marked differences in spatial cohesiveness within groups as well as spatial overlap among groups. Now, much as I'd love to take the time today and walk you through each of the amazing places I've worked to study different species of tucotucos, I'm mindful of the time. So I'll cut to the chase a little bit, but currently we're at nine different species that have been characterized and counting. And here I've simply placed each species, the dot for the study site for each species on a map, of the region. You can see we've gone everywhere now from southern Peru down to Tierra del Fuego. And I've indicated for each species with a colored dot roughly where it falls in that developing cartoon schematic for social structure. Green represents solitary species. Red is the most social, which remains the colonial tucotuco, the one I started with. But as you can see, as we've kind of begun working our way around Argentina and around the genus Tonomis, we are finding variation in patterns of social structure. To return to the cartoon diagram and represent that in that form, this is kind of where we are today. My effort to cartoon the variation, the variance that we're finding in terms of space use and social structure. And then again, with the same code, color code scheme below the, the axis there. I wanna emphasize, I've arranged this cartoon or these diagrams based on increasing degree and increasing temporal persistence of spatial overlap among individuals. 
that's my arrangement. And although laying it out like this in this diagram makes it look like, whoa, there's a really nice continuum from solitary to what is currently the most social tuco tuco that we're aware of. That's my arrangement, and that may not be how natural selection looks at these contrasts. So that leads me to kind of my final point in a way for today, and that is now that we've arrived at this point, we have a much fuller comparative understanding of social structure and tuco tucos, and believe me, this continues to grow, and we continue to study additional species each year. But having arrived at this point, what do we do with this information? Well, to me, there's several things. One is, again, it's just allowed me to realize my personal professional goal of being, I guess, the Jane Goodall of Tuco Tucos. I don't know. I'm happy to own that. Um, but more scientifically, or back to that, there has to be a question idea. I think there are at least a couple of uses for this information. One is, having arrived at this now n equals 9 and growing, I think we're at a point where we can begin to look for demographic and ecological correlates of the different variants in social structure that we're seeing. Classic behavioral ecology, but here's a new system where I think we've arrived at the point we can start to ask those questions. The other thing that I think we can do with this scheme is start to look for adaptively important social transitions. And I kind of alluded to this a second ago that I'm the one who's created this scheme. That may not be the way natural selection would look at the different variants depicted here. And I think it's interesting to begin exploring what are the actual important transitions between social structures from a selective standpoint. I'm going to pee and then get my coat and stuff to get ready to go. Okay. <laughs> I'm not sure. Yeah, but um, for example, is the transition from every individual having its own nest to sharing nests, is that something we should be paying particular attention to? Or is there something selectively important about going all in and sharing space completely the way that colonial tuco tu colonial tuco tucos do, but none of the other species studied to date seem to do. So the, this to me is the value of developing this scheme. And although I'm happy, I'm content, I'm fulfilled to simply have been generating this scheme, I do hope and think it has value going forward. And I hope you'll agree with that statement. And anyone who's interested in following up and pursuing this, I'd love to talk about your thoughts, your ideas, your suggestions about how to start using this information to dig deeper, so to speak, into the reasons for this variability within the genus Tonomies. Since we're talking comparatively, I would be remiss if I didn't take a second to talk about the phylogenetic framework for all of this. This is only a partial phylogeny of the genus Tonomies. Much of the, the phylogeny of these animals is still under revision, still being worked out. But we know enough to suggest that group living has evolved multiple times within this genus. And to me, that's important information to add to the comparative picture because it provides multiple independent origins of group living. And that allows us to look across convergent examples of that social structure and to create more independent tests of the ecological adaptive etc factors that seem to underlie the variation we're looking at. So important point from a phylogenetic perspective, this also seems to be an increasingly ideal system for comparative work. The phylogenetic perspective also helps shape our future studies, meaning our work over the next few years. Now again, I'd be happy to just keep driving around. I was joking with Eduardo and Lauren before the talk began that my colleagues have my retirement all planned. We're going to buy a VW microbus and drive up and down the Andes studying Tuco Tucos. I'm all in with that. And as much as I would love to do that, how does we need a little bit more structure or organization to how we go about this. And so using the phylogenetic information that's now available, for the next few years, we're going to focus on two subclades of Tuco Tucos. One is the Opimus clade, the bigger red rectangle here. This clade contains four named species that range in elevation and habitat from mid-elevation Monte Desert to high-elevation Puna habitat in northwestern Argentina. 
This clade also includes the highland tuco tuco tonomies opimus that we've studied and know is social. In contrast, preliminary data indicate that at least one of the other four species in the clade is solitary. So focusing a little bit from a phylogenetic perspective, but with a range of social structures and habitats, just helping us narrow the questions down a little bit from an evolutionary perspective. The other clade that we'll be focusing on, the smaller rectangle here, is the sociabilis clade. That's probably an obvious choice. But the reason this is suddenly more exciting is that up until a year ago, we didn't know what the sister species was to the colonial tuco tuco. For a couple decades, it had sat alone at the base of the phylogeny for tuco tucos. It still does in this figure. But a year ago, um, an analysis was published that now identifies a sister species, Tonomys plebiscitum, that occurs further south in Patagonia. And I've seen these animals. It looks to me superficially, ooh, that's another bad subterranean rodent pun, but it looks to me initially that they are social, but perhaps less so than sociabilis. And part of the plan is to go in and characterize their social structure in detail, again, with a more specific focused phylogenetic framework for the comparative studies that we're engaged in. So still plenty of time for me to do. But in the interest of time, again, I'll just quickly wrap up that I hope I've convinced you of several things today. One is first that tuco tucos are interesting and worth studying. Maybe more specifically, that our studies of colonial tuco tucos are, we think, generating new insights into differences in individual dispersal decisions. And that's important because, again, that, that balance between natal dispersal and natal philopatry underlies group living, not just in some of the species of these rodents, but more generally in many of the social organisms that we study. I hope I've also convinced you that characterizations of previously unstudied species of tuco tucos are revealing unexpected diversity in social structure, and that that comparative, emerging comparative framework may be useful and informative going forward. And that leads me to the final point, which is the emerging phylogenetically informed analyses that are ongoing and planned should, we hope, improve understanding of the factors favoring group living. Again, not just in this particular lineage of rodents, but in other mammals and, and um, animals more generally. So I'll thank you for your time today. I'll whip up that last slide with as many Thanks as I could fit in, but most importantly, thanks to all of you for your time and attention this morning. I'll stop there and then take questions if anyone has questions. Well, thank you very much, Eileen, for a really fascinating talk and summary of your work. Um, this is the opportunity for us to ask questions. Um, again, if you're new to the fine, uh, we ask that you please put a question mark in the chat. And I will um, forward that to, to Eileen. And also, please tell us you know, where you're from and your primary interest, because we're trying to continue to build community here. Those of you who are on um, YouTube, uh, please post your questions in YouTube, and Logan will um, forward those on to us here. And so let me get into the chat here. And to start, uh, the first question is coming from Eduardo, please. Thank you, Lauren. I'm Eduardo Fernandez Duque from Yale University, today attending from, from Argentina where I'm gonna leave. Eileen, thank you so much for the wonderful talk. I'm so glad we managed to, to get you to present your fascinating work. Very, two questions. One is very simple. Where is it in Uruguay or Argentina that you're studying the Rio Negrensis? And if it is in Entre Rios, where in Entre Rios? I just ask because I'm so close to the area. Where is it in Entre Rios? That's a very simple factual question. The other one, which is going to be, I hope, of more interest to the broader audience is, I really appreciate your humbleness. It's been almost 30 years and I have no doubts, I mean, I agree with you so much, we've learned so much, so much progress, and still it's like we feel what the heck is determining this range of variation, right? And that's the way it is. 
because you started telling us identifying those three major, major ecological factors, which they are so big that really don't explain much if we just call them soil, food, or rainfall. And now you're telling us that you're in a better position to start asking more precise questions. Do, help me understand, is it really the case that more detailed, better informed phylogenetic reconstructions can, can help us get at what you're alluding as the need to identify causal factors or is it only that it's gonna allow us to better sort them out, better predict? Mm -hmm. that, that's where I have doubts that we need more of the same. I, I wish we'll see over the next many decades, experimental approaches to manipulating mm -hmm. factors that may trigger different decisions in females and males in different circumstances. I think that's where we're gonna get at understanding what's really driving the evolution of these behavioral traits. Okay, can you comment on that? Sure. First, to answer your first question, Edward, <laughs> the Rio Negrensis are actually on the Uruguayan side of the river near in Maldonado province. Um, it's only a couple years ago that Rio Negrensis was finally documented on the Argentine side. So all of the existing work is over in Uruguay and, and with colleagues in Montevideo. Um, so that's that question. The other more substantive, larger one I agree absolutely with what you're saying. Um, see if I can capture the sense of your question. To me, the value of including the phylogenetic information is twofold. One is to help us identify within, in this case, within the genus Tonomies, if there are multiple independent origins of the same phenomenon, in this case, group living only to help us identify species that might be better targets for comparison, right? Because if they're doing the same thing, but have evolved that pattern, whatever it is, social structure independently from, you know, experimental perspective, anything like that, to me, that provides a stronger test, right? And this is my museum background kicking in, I think, right? Where we're, um, I'm surrounded by people who worry about these things, but I do agree that independence is useful. The other reason for me that the phylogenetic information has been useful is simply to help narrow the focus, right? Because as I kind of mentioned, I could spend the rest of my life traveling around Argentina studying different species and characterizing their behavior. And then it becomes a challenge. What do you do? How do you process all of that information? How do you start to make sense of it? To me, by using the phylogenetic information to narrow the scope of the comparisons a little bit, it's almost the reverse. We can pick now a closely related set of species that vary in behavior and ask what contributes to that variation. So it's kind of coming at it almost from two ends, right? Divergence among closely related taxa and looking at what seems to be associated with that and convergence among independent examples of the phenomenon to look at what's associated with that. Does that make sense? But I absolutely agree with you that within any of those species or comparisons, experimental work would be great and would be amazing. And we've thought about, you know, if we, in some of these species we've worked with, you know, if we experimentally altered, say, population density, or sex ratio, you know, what would be the impact on social structure? Mm -hmm. Could we shift things in ways that would fit what we think is going on? So I don't know if I'm answering your question exactly, yeah. but I guess I see it as all part of the big picture. Of what absolutely, we're absolutely. It wasn't, it probably wasn't as much a question as, as a comment inviting your, your more informed comments. Absolutely, I agree. If, how, any chance that you may have hybrid zones between the Tukotuko species in the Barilochi area, how big is that geographic barrier between the colonial one and the, and the solitary one? To the best of my knowledge, anyone's knowledge, there is no, um, certainly no hybridization and actually no physical contact. That they occur on opposite sides of the Rio Limay. I know you've been to Bariloche. You taught me to pronounce that word correctly 35 years ago. <laughs> I don't know if you remember, but the real Limay that divides them is a substantial river. And so, you know, it's not something they can easily cross. And all of our work in that region, you know, we've never found 
one species on, so to speak, the wrong side of the river. And so no potential for hybridization that we're aware of yet. Yeah. So. Thank you so much. Fantastic program. Thanks. Thanks, Eduardo. I don't know, Lauren, should I just monitor? It looks like Michael yeah. Taborski is next up. <laughs> I'll question. do it for you. You don't have to worry about it. I'll do it okay. for you. So um, yeah, Michael, please go ahead. Hey, uh, Michael Taborski, University of Bern, currently at the uh, Institute of Advanced Study in Berlin. Thank you very much, Eileen, and say hi. Yeah, good to see you, yes. <laughs> uh, very nice uh, information, but, but I'm still missing some important details, apparently. Okay. Um, uh, that regard dispersal decisions. Uh, the one thing that I'm not sure whether you have any information about, but is dispersal deliberate? I mean, do the females leave by their own account or are they perhaps forced to leave in, in so sociabilis? Uh, and related to that, how, how great is the proportion of uh, females that disperse as compared to those that stay home? Uh, and is that depending on, I mean, the, the proportion that disperses is depending on population density or things yeah. like that? Yeah. I'll let you start with your second one first, Michael, and go backwards if that's okay. Um, the data that I reported from the field, as you probably picked up on, those are outcomes, correct? Meaning, in other words, that was the proportion of females captured as adults for which we could backtrack and say they dispersed or they were philopatric. So in other words, the success stories, right? The ones that did whatever they were going to do and survived. We don't know how many individuals as juveniles attempt to disperse and fail. Ditto mm -hmm. for philopatric individuals. That you know, during the time that a lot of this field work was going on, we didn't have the technology or the setup to be able to monitor individual movements in the way that would be ideal, right? To actually track and follow individuals as they attempt to do whatever it is they're going to do and then look at who survives and who doesn't. That's a common limitation of dispersal studies. That is now changing. And, and we're trying to get the funding together. Two things have changed. One is technology has changed and it's now technically possible to monitor individual female colonial tuco tucos remotely to monitor their movements, even if we're not there and find out who tries to disperse, but maybe doesn't make it, ditto Philopatry. The other thing that changed is the ownership of the land available to work on where these animals are that now allows us to do things like install uh, you know, remote monitoring towers or antennas or grid systems that in the past that was not an option. So we're trying to get the money together to go back and ask exactly that question. Um, in terms of what we do see the success stories, it's about two thirds of the yearling females that we catch are still philopatric or still in their natal burrow system and about a third that had dispersed. But again, those are the success stories, right? They don't include the zeros. Um, back then to your first question, are they, do they choose to leave or are they kicked out? Excellent question. We don't, didn't know the answer starting out and, and for reasons I guess I can't even really clearly identify, I assumed it was individuals choosing to leave. Maybe that was partly driven by the idea that it's the disperser yearlings that have higher direct fitness and, you know, kind of my just biases in my thinking. One somewhat unexpected outcome of the lab, and I say this cautiously because it's still, you know, kind of in the anecdotal phase, is we're finding more and more, though, that within a captive family, there is often aggression from the adult female towards juvenile female pups, and it's not random who that aggression is targeted towards. So we're more and more starting to think Maybe it's more a question of, yes, being kicked out. And that if that's the case, that might change your expectations about who's leaving, you know, in terms of, is it the biggest female, the smallest female, the most social, least social? So it's an excellent question. And we're, we're I want to say, starting to see evidence, it may not be, well, 
it may not be what we initially thought. Does that make sense? That's kind of an invasive answer in a way, but that's where we are. <laughs> yeah, I think I think that is a, a very interesting aspect. And now apparently you have the ability to look into that in more detail in your in your captive colonies. So I think that, yeah. that will be really extremely interesting to see what comes out. Just yeah. one short other question. What's about males? Do they all disperse? Yes, yes, they all do. Um, both right away, right away before starting to reproduce. Yes, they all disperse at the end of their juvenile season before their first breeding season, and they disperse for those that survive more than one adult season, disperse between seasons. Yeah, mm. yeah. Okay. okay, thanks very much. Thanks, Michael. Good to see you. All right, our next question is from Karsten. Yes, my name is Carsten Schrodin from the Sea Noise in Strasbourg, France, studying mammalian social evolution, mainly small mammals in South Africa. Yes, thank you for a great talk. I really love to see all these um, field data from, from different species and versus a comment. I think it emphasizes how important it is to really study species to know what their social system is instead of assuming that it's an underground living rodents or it's solitary. So I think it's really important that we have this, this real data instead of just thinking everything is solitary that we don't know very well. Now my, my question, and I will explain why I'm asking this, is why you focus on interspecific instead of intraspecific variation in social organization or social structure, how you call it. I mean, you emphasized during your, the second half of your talk that sociabilis is a highly social species, but at the beginning you showed graphs that show that actually most embarrassed systems are occupied by solitary females. Second most common are pair living females, and then um, the group living ones are actually more rare than the, sol the, the solitary ones. So for me, the main social organization would still be solitary living, followed by pair living, then followed by group living, making for some very interesting variation within this population. But you seem to prefer focusing on comparison between species. Um, how, to, how, to, how to answer that? Because I don't disagree with you, Karsten. That, and what do I want to say? Sorry, my brain just I just suddenly mentally popped back to Argentina and I'm reviewing mentally all the amazing places that I've been and visited and there was a component of that. Um, I think also it's just there's only so much time and energy right and I chose to start looking at other species to get a sense across this incredibly speciose genus but I don't disagree with you. And in fact, I didn't present the data today, but we have started looking intraspecifically, somewhat in the colonial Tuco Tuco, but more so in that Highland Tuco Tuco, the, the second social species that I talked about. And we are finding really pronounced differences within that species. I don't think it's a question of one being more important than the other or more interesting than the other. I think it was just Again, almost there's only so much that I could do, and I really wanted to see what other species were doing to get a sense of, are there other comparative opportunities out there? So, yeah, it's kind of a non-answer, but that had to make a choice and do something, couldn't do it all, I guess. <laughs> That's it. Okay, uh, at least for people doing comparative studies, it might be even more worthwhile to have more species with some real data for the analysis. Okay, so the next question is from Zulema. Yes, hi, Zulema Tang Martinez. I'm retired from the University of Missouri in St. Louis. And fabulous talk, Eileen, really enjoyed oh, thanks, it. Zulema. And But you left me like, no, no, when you said <laughs> that the results of your study were top secret. <laughs> Don't give them to Trump. <laughs> Okay. <laughs> I, was, I was dying to find out what results you got. So I have, as usual, I have several questions. Um, in, in sociabilis, how long does the male stay with mm -hmm. the females? Are they pretty much like, are they there for a lifetime or are they? Um, no, no, at most. Moving? 
So yeah. Group, group. Okay. Sorry. So in most one breeding season, um, that there's some shuffling of males during the breeding season. Wow. We finally have the genetic markers. So back up a step, you know, we go in and the bulk of the field time is simply trying to catch everybody in the population to find out who's there, where they are, who they're living with. We do see some evidence of shuffling of males early in the breeding season, you know, that leading to the possibility that the fathers of the different litters with well, different males may father litters within a group. We finally now have the genetic tools needed to look at that quantitatively. One constraint on research with colonial tuco tucos has been that they are highly inbred in nature, both demographically and genetically. And therefore, it's been difficult to do all the classic paternity types of analyses and things like that. But we finally have a panel of SNP markers that we think will allow us to look at paternity and confirm, is there more than one male involved within the breeding season? When we capture a colony, there's never more than one adult male present at that moment in time. The few instances where we've run across, you know, we do find males that are very bitten, chewed up, you know, and the implication is it's male-male aggressions. And, and certainly in the lab, males cannot be housed together past the age of about four months. So all of which suggests it's one male per group at a time. The dispersal data, movement data that I showed, and we have a larger sample size, I need to update that table. Males are also then moving between breeding seasons. And so they are, yes, much more mobile, move much more than females do, yes. Does that and answer I, that? Yeah, yeah. yeah, and I assume that they're also completely unrelated to the females. In in an immediate demographic sense, yes, meaning they come from a different borough system, but the long-term demographic monitoring has revealed that within the matter of, say, five field seasons, five generations, pretty much everybody is related within that, yeah. within a local population. So, yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah that makes sense. That's what I was wondering. Yeah. Um, and also in relation to relatedness, given that Opimas is moving, the, they seem to be moving around for, and changing groups from year to year. Mm -hmm. um, what is the genetic relatedness in those groups for the females? Excellent. Or, or, or I guess yeah. since they have more than one male in general, what is the relatedness in those groups? Excellent question. We're just finishing microsatellite analyses right now that will answer that genetically. Demographically, the evidence is not super related, meaning both the combination of the movement and overall, there seems to be much more immigration in that situation, that study population than say in the sociabilis. My prediction is that relatedness among both sexes is going to be much lower in the opimus. Yeah. And honestly, if I had to predict what's going on there, and we're again, we're working on the analyses, it's not so much the social group, it's individuals moving around, positioning themselves for better access to the patches of food that are most valuable. And that that's what's really driving the dynamic mm -hmm. in that system which is very different than the setup in sociabilis, yeah. Yeah, it's really interesting. And this, uh, the, my, I guess my last question is sort of a broader mm -hmm. conceptual question, which I suspect you'll be, be able to answer very quickly. You started out talking about the naked mole rats and how the idea was that food, soil, and rainfall mm -hmm. were the critical factors. Mm -hmm. And so now, you know, you started out in the tuco, tucos and almost immediately you had sociabilis and right across the river you had mm -hmm. Higgii, which were totally different. Mm -hmm. And so what's your opinion <laughs> about this food, soil, and rainfall? I mean, presumably, yeah. sociabilis and Higgii have the same I mean, there's, yeah. there are no huge differences, right, in those factors? Right. And I mean, that was the original question. And we, we asked that question. And in the Limai Valley there, okay, rainfall, 
absolutely no difference. The, the spacing, you know, if it rains on one side of the river, it's raining on the <laughs> other side of the river. Absolutely the same. Soil, we went out and did a lot of penetrometry and measuring all kinds of soil attributes. No difference. The difference there is, and this is going to lead to what I think is going on, the, the general habitat in that area is Patagonian steppe grassland. So generally pretty arid, you know, relatively sparse vegetation, a few key species. But here and there where moisture collects, you get a very different set of vegetation that is, you know, annual grasses, a very different set of shrubs, much richer patches of vegetation. The Argentine term for those is magin or magines. Sociabolus is a machine specialist. We've now hiked up and down that valley for decades, and where we find Sociabolus is associated with these wetter patches. They aren't occurring in the intervening steppe habitat. Haygai, the solitary species, is everywhere. They live in the machine patches on their side of the river, but they also live in the intervening steppe. So I, I say all that because when we compare soil for populations of the two species in machines, absolutely no difference. If you go to the steppe where the Haygai are in the steppe, that soil is actually much harder, but that's the opposite prediction than would be made yeah. by the ideas for molarets, because you know those, right? You've worked with Stan a lot. So soil, there is potentially an effect, but it's a reverse of what would be predicted. The real and then food resources, animals living in the Magines are eating absolutely the same thing. The diet for Haygai changes when it's in the steppe, but again, it's that steppe Magine contrast. So really where our thinking has gone, well, first, the mole rat idea doesn't work for these two tuco tucos, right? That was pretty clear. What really seems to drive the system for sociabolus is the specialization for machine habitats. Whatever <laughs> underlies that and holds them in those machines creates for them a very patchy distribution of suitable habitat and dispersal from patch to patch is, you know, spatially unpredictable, it can be a long distance, you know, very challenging, we assume. For Haygai, we're basically everything is okay. We predict that dispersal is relatively easier, and so there isn't the same selective pressure to be philopatric or to constrain dispersal in the solitary species. And that's kind of the working hypothesis. Um, you know, I'm not sure how, I'm still thinking about how I would test that, but certainly all of the available habitat information, spatial distribution of habitats kind of fits with that and builds towards that idea. Does that make sense? Yeah, that makes sense. What about what about predation? They do. They are preyed on. <laughs> <laughs> um, for both species, the suite of predators seems to be the same. It's uh, all almost exclusively surface predators, meaning you know raptors, owls, foxes. Um, there is nothing there, you know, there are no snakes in this area that can get into burrows and eat the animals. There are no mustelid like predators that can get into the burrows and eat them in the burrows. So the danger is all really on the surface. The suite of animals is the same. And again, you can watch an individual raptor or owl cross the river and hunt both of our study sites. There may be a little difference in terms of the sociabolus are strictly diurnal. The Haygai are a little bit more crepuscular or you know, active throughout the 24 hours. So that might shift a little bit the details of you know, relative frequency of predation. Um, but there's no conspicuous difference, you know, like completely different type of predator or completely different exposure. Yeah. 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 Thanks, Eileen. Yeah. All right. So our next question is from Emery. Hi, Eileen. It was a great talk. Um, I'm a postdoc at uh, Universidad Católica in Chile, and yes. I'm here with <laughs> yes, <sorry. laughs> working with the Goose, and I'm here with uh, other lab mates. Um, so we all have a question. Sure. Uh, yes. Um, so I'll start with the dispersal. 
Um, do you also have kind of like information, especially maybe from your captive population, of like what the factors of like the litter size and the litter composition, like maybe difference in uh, if there's a meal present or not? Can you can you kind of like yeah give some information about that? Yeah, for the field, that's really tough, again, because we only see the outcomes, right, the success stories. And so there's a lot that happens or can happen between when we catch individuals as juveniles and know the composition of their natal family, right, because we do know it at that stage, and who survives and we can identify as having dispersed or being philopatric. Again, classic field problem with studying dispersal that we have not overcome. So the field data are a little limited. I'm actually in the process of taking a deeper dive into that right now in preparation for this presentation I have to give over this summer. But I'm not sure it's going to be super informative from the field, again, just because there's so many animals, we don't know what happened to them. In the lab, we are definitely tracking that information. It's factored into the analyses we're running right now in terms of, you know, yes, litter size, the sex ratio, things like that. Um, my best guess at this point would be litter size is not particularly critical. What may be more critical is the number of females in the litter. Again, partly as we're seeing this aggressive aggression from the moms. The lab, the downside of the lab, of course, is that everybody is extremely well fed, you know, and, and cared for and protected. And so we may not be seeing the same suite of challenges animals would face in the wild, right? Um, but my guess more and more would be it, it's something between females more so than, say, like total litter size or whether the dad is present or something like that. Yeah. Oh, so, interesting. Yeah. yeah, thank you. So did, um, did, did others have, yeah, sorry, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Hi, uh, my name is Antonia and I have two questions. Uh, the first one is really short. I don't know if I miss it during the presentations, but um, those females that are alone, uh, are like really alone or they are with another females that perhaps aren't uh, related to them? Um, in the colonial tuco tuco, the one that I talked about most. Yeah. Yeah. There's only one female. Ah, there, okay. She she may have a male just like anybody else, right? But no, she is the only female. And so the critical difference was she's not with any female kin, right? Okay. Does that make sense? Yeah, no, I I, I was uh, thinking more like perhaps they could be alone, but with another female that isn't related to them. So thinking perhaps in more like a, a uh, relation complexity and not so structural. No, in, in that species, all the data we have indicates that if a female disperses, she has to find an empty burrow system. We've never seen females join, you know, females from different natal groups join to create a group or anything like that, or females join an existing group. Those dispersers, all the ones that we identify, are always living alone in what had either been an unoccupied burrow system the previous year or had been occupied by a group that no longer exists, right? So, so just part of their biology, their natural history seems to be if you disperse, you have to find an empty burrow system, and that means you will live alone, at least in terms of other females for that first year. Yeah. Now, oh, yeah. Okay. And uh, the second one, it's kind of the same, the same line of um, Taborski question. Mm -hmm. And is it like these kind of decisions to be alone or in group um, depends on uh, environmental conditions, perhaps? Uh, some years that have like more rough conditions or uh, less, I don't know, food or some, or some kind of resource mm -hmm. can enhance like the response of the solitary females and mm -hmm. if they could uh, have um, higher reproductive success. I would absolutely bet that is the case, but I don't have the data to answer it. 
again, in part because what we see are just the ones that survived, right? But I would be yeah. totally willing to predict that if, for example, it's a particularly difficult year, food is more limited, something like that, that the proportion of females that try to disperse is higher than in a really good year where everybody has lots of food, something like that. I absolutely agree. I think those factors are part of the story, but I don't have the information to analyze them in a meaningful way. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you very much. Yeah. And, uh... Hi, I'm so Hi. sorry we were like <laughs> jumping toward each other. Uh, thank you so much for your talk. It's very interesting, everything that you told us. Um, I was wondering if um, the females, I mean, at least in your field work, uh, if you have measured any uh, masculinization uh, in the females that disperse, like maybe they're higher uh, HDD or testosterone or something like that. We did not for the field animals, um, unfortunately. We have not to date, right? And I should preface, you know, the field work has been a little disrupted at this point, well, by the pandemic was one. Prior to that, there had been a big volcanic eruption, Pujewe, you, you, you in Chile, Santiago would have remembered that, that disrupted things for a few years. So the field work for that particular population and species has been a little disrupted and we hope to get back to it now. We did not collect fecal or blood samples during the years we were collecting that demographic information to ask that question. We are doing it in the lab though with the captive animals that we're monitoring that we're using fecal glucocorticoid measures to look at stress physiology and also fecal samples to look at testosterone levels to ask, yes, if there's any relationship there, even among females. Um, I know that, you know, I also, because I know Lauren's on this call and you're, you know, Luis and Errol Connections, was thinking about the work that's been done in Daegu's looking at anogenital distance and things like that. And we've never looked at that in, in the Tucos, but just my, you know, handling how many thousands of tucos I've now looked at and sex looking at their genitalia, you know, there are definitely animals it's harder to sex than others. And so there could be something going on there and we've just never, you know, had the whatever asked mm -hmm. that question. Yeah. Does that okay. help? Yeah. Yes. And also I have another question because previously you mentioned that at least in captivity, you saw that the aggression from the mother to their pups that was clearly directed to some of them. So I was wondering if you have ever looked into the advantage of actually disperse when you are the one that is constantly being aggressed, um, I mean, being attacked by your mother versus being in a forced uh, residence. Because you compare only groups that were dispersed all versus um, dispersed and also um, lonely territory breeder versus like the group breeder. Mm -hmm. But if you're receiving those hard uh, conditions in the early development, then it's clearly that you don't have like any options. So mm -hmm. maybe staying there, being a resident, if you are the one that is constantly being aggressed, um, mm -hmm. being attacked, uh, shouldn't be like a good idea, you know? So have you m measured that, like compare those kind of groups? Um, in the field, no because we didn't at that point, well, A, didn't have the detailed observations to suggest that aggression might be a part of it, right? That again, you know, we catch animals and we can tell for the ones that survive whether they've dispersed or not. We can backtrack a little bit to ask questions about natal group size and composition, but we don't have that type of detailed behavioral data from the field. But in the lab, well, A, it's in the lab that we first started seeing this aggression by females to even start thinking about that. And B, you know, now we're monitoring it, right, to try and understand what the patterns are, like, you know, which pups are the targets of aggression and kind of what seems to correlate with that. Um, but I absolutely agree, depending on which way that goes, if individuals choose to leave versus are kind of forced out, might really affect not only who's dispersing, but what their potential for success is, right? Like for, I'm just, I'm totally speculating here, but if say it's the smallest pup 
in a family that is the one that is attacked and driven out for a variety of reasons you might predict they're less likely to be successful than a large pup that chose to leave or something like that does that make sense i'm just speculating here but i think that difference whether it's choice or you're forced out coupled with if there's any pattern as to which pups tend to be targeted for aggression could really change our understanding or our perspective on yeah the relative costs and benefits yeah Does that yeah sense? i mean yeah because i was also thinking that even if you see in the field that because you are measuring the field of success of like surviving to the next year so you only know who's already like disperse and survive mm -hmm. so if you came from a different i mean a difficult nest when your early social conditions are like very harsh and then you are like forced out then for me it would be like very easy to believe that even after breeding you're already passing a clue from you as a mother mm -hmm. of hard condition like experimental i mean environmental hard conditions so maybe their pups they just like leave even further so yeah. you're not able to tap them. It doesn't mean that they're like actually like less successful. Maybe they just go farther. It might be an option. No, no, no. And that's a whole nother line of inquiry that we just haven't even touched is kind of the transmission of those patterns across generations, right? Both both in a literal potential genetic sense, but also thinking of, you know, a lot of the work coming out of rats showing that maternal environment is really critical, right? We just haven't even looked at that, although increasingly in the lab we could, because we're now on generation three or so of females, you know, where we behaviorally phenotype them all as pups, they become the breeders for the next year, you know, and that, and then we follow their litters. And so we're going to get to the point pretty soon where we could ask if there's any, yes, cross generational pattern to any of that. Yeah. Yeah. Cool. Great mm -hmm. question. Yeah. Thank you so yeah. much. Yeah. Bye bye. Okay. So, Eileen, I'm, I'm next in the queue, but I'm going to, I'm going to defer to Clara. <laughs> Clara, okay. Please go. And then I have questions for you. But go ahead, okay. Clara, please. There we go. Um, thank you so much. This is Clara B. Jones, um, retired social evolution. Um, there's so much here that one doesn't know where to start, but I'll be very, very brief. This is just wonderful work. Um, quickly, obviously intraspecific studies are important, but Darwin's book was called Origin of Species. Mm -hmm. So by studying across taxa, we can obviously ask the large evolutionary questions, mm -hmm. not only speciation, but transitions and all the other Ernst Meyer, et cetera, points that have been made in the literature. Mm -hmm. So I think that obviously that's a good choice. Secondly, in the literature, social behavior is often um, described as a quote unquote labile trait. Mm -hmm. And I think that your work beautifully points out how labile sociality can be. Um, also, let's see, lability. Also, I'd like to point out, and I'm sure you know, that tuco tucos are related to uh, mole rats. They're both uh, hystricognats. Yes, yes. So by uh, taking this broad approach, you obviously uh, are placing your work in a huge um, uh, background of potential evolutionary questions. And again, that is just so exciting. Um, finally, and this is my, this is my question. Um, 
you could conduct experiments with simulations, with mathematical simulations, even if you cannot or do not choose to conduct experiments in the field as many animal behaviorists choose not to do. Um, I'm wondering uh, if you uh, would do this. So, so first, thanks for your comments, Clara, about the framework. What, what would you simulate? For example, what are you thinking of? What would you want to simulate as opposed to manipulating? Well, almost experience? anything. I mean, you could test hypotheses with uh, simulations by plugging in different parameters mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and looking at the variation of parameters and which ones, which outcoming models most correspond to the data, to the real world mm -hmm. data that mm -hmm. you're getting from your uh, studies, from your empirical work. Mm -hmm. And I'm trying to think, and this is probably not the best moment for me to try to do that well. <laughs> <laughs> but I think I think most of these simulations are done with individual level um, models, mm -hmm. and um, you know one of your graduate students could easily learn that. And I I agree. I'm I'm just trying to think through. Like I'm thinking, I guess, of this the issue of dispersal. How I would parameterize. I'm not disagreeing. I just haven't thought about how I would parameterize a simulation of dispersal, but it's an interesting thought. You're right, I'd have to have a grad student do it. I don't have those kinds of skills, <laughs> but, but- Anyway, but, anyway, uh, thanks so much. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> okay. Lauren, uh, you have yeah, questions? I'm, some, I'm amazed. <laughs> What's that? I'm amazed you have questions. <laughs> I have questions, but the thing is, they. they not all of them made it through the gauntlet of questions. This time, the, the Chileans asked a lot of my questions. It's not okay. surprising, you know, the yeah, related, yeah. intellectually related at least. Um, but I think Salema didn't take them this time. <laughs> um, no, I, 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 a couple of my questions, I, again, that was really fun to see that and, and made me think a lot about things. And you can imagine some of my questions align with what Karsten was getting at, mm -hmm. for obvious reasons. And I think, as a follow-up to Karsten's question, I'm gonna to go towards the highland species. Mm -hmm. um, I noticed there was a lot of variation. You were talking about variation in spatial overlap. Mm -hmm. Are there any um, characteristics of the individuals who find them in different spatial, te spatial temporal connections with this group? So in other words, have you done any network, work, network analyses to look into that kind of stuff? We have, this was work led by Shannon O'Brien who completed her PhD a couple of years ago, I think now. Um, she ran social network analyses, you know, full disclosure, our networks again are based largely on spatial relationships rather than direct observations of social interactions, right? But nevertheless, we did the analyses there's definitely variation in all of the standard workhorse network metrics, but she could not find a lot of predictive parameters, meaning in other words, sex or age. We used often had to use number of years on the study site, you know, as an adult, as a proxy for age, but it's probably pretty close. There was again a general tendency for individuals to move towards larger social groups over time and consistent with that the network metrics most associated with group size tended to increase that was the one pattern that really emerged significant pattern that emerged but coupled with that and you're right i didn't say a lot about it today and i think there's still a lot to unpack even if in individuals are moving towards larger groups over time, there's a huge variability in who's in those groups. And again, maybe I'm coming at this too much with my sociabilis biases built in where a group is your kin group and the only way you add is through philopatry and you lose through um, you know, mortality, right? 
versus in the highland tuco tucos there's you know folks are shuttling around and animals that were together in a group one year may all still be alive the following year but in different groups you know they're and so yes there's a huge i think piece of variability there that we just haven't plumbed very deeply yet um but initially at least sex doesn't seem to be a huge predictor you know we've looked at it in relation to glucocorticoids that doesn't seem to be you know a factor really the one thing that emerged was kind of yeah like age and this general tendency but that doesn't it's not like you're just accumulating more relatives it's more indiv coupled with sorry at, at this point i'm probably making a lot of sense coupled with the changes in spatial locations of individuals it really if i had to anthropomorphize seems like they're jockeying or positioning themselves to move to better parts of the study site does that make sense and that's yeah, yeah. one piece we are working on now is we've measured you know food resource distribution in excruciating detail and have mapped the whole study site with regard to food availability and are now trying to relate that to the you know group locations and dynamics but that's my takeaway but i think yeah there is more there it can be un unpacked yeah so yeah and, and to follow up on that i wonder maybe this is a comment might not be a question it's late <laughs> behind so the brain's shutting down i'm sure for all of us um like thinking back to dai's talk last week which really thought about the off season, you know, I don't know mm -hmm. if that's the right mm -hmm. word, but I mm -hmm. wonder if dynamics that occur during traditional times of year where we traditionally don't study sociality when they're not breeding could influence these, this variation that we see within units. Sure. I mean, you know, but I can say the colonial tuco tucos, which are better studied, those groups seem consistent throughout the year. I mean, I've gone at other times of year, right? And your group is your group. The Highland Tuco Tuco, I've invested less time and energy, and I have gone at other times of year. And again, there's already, you know, there's there's always more shuffling from visit to visit in that species. Um, but you're right, I think there's a lot we miss because we're just constrained to these kind of periodic field efforts, right? Does that, yeah, yeah. Does that yeah. make sense as an answer? <laughs> yeah, no, it does. I mean, when we expanded the study of the degus into the mating period, it really changed our mm -hmm. view of these animals. And yeah. clearly the degus are different than the tucos, obviously, you know. Yeah. Far fewer nice p values, I think, the degus. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> um, and I think I had one more question, and I don't know if it was covered, but I was thinking it, I, it goes back to Michael's question, and I think. Anne Marie or one of the students in Chile asked this. Have you, do you know anything about like the life history or the experiences of the aggressive females? The moms, you mean? The moms. And, I, and I'm asking that question and I hesitate to say it. I don't know what kind of backlash I'll get. Thinking about like Trivers and Willard, you know, are they, is aggression towards the offspring based on like maternal condition? And I think that last question about the body size she usually goes after the smaller ones. Is mm -hmm. that seasonal, like in terms of what's going on in the environment? Or is it, could it be more about just her experience? You know, was she targeted? And yeah. Boy, great questions. I, and I don't have clear answers. I mean, what we're observing in the lab, and again, this is something that really emerged in the lab. So over the last couple of years, as we've focused more on all of all this dispersal related stuff it's post weaning so moms are in better condition than they were when they were lactating right and they're you know their body weights are recovering they're in better condition than they were at the height of lactation temporally it seems to coincide more with yes when females should start dispersing if they're going to it seems to be you know it's, again crude my impression is it's targeted more at the smaller females in a family or a litter which at first surprised me because if i was thinking competition i might think that the bigger female might be more of a threat so to speak if resources are limited but again maybe that's just a preconceived bias that i have and instead what you want to do is get rid of the you know the less the ones who are less likely to be successful or something like that. Um, 
I don't know if I'm answering your question. I'm just kind of reflecting on what we're seeing, whether that's her experience or not. Yeah, it was one. It was the third student in Santiago who asked, we're getting close to where we could start to ask across generations, you know, if there are patterns in terms of, you know, I don't know, everything from glucocorticoid levels to response in these different behavioral trials to, yes, your interactions with your offspring, if there are any kind of cross-generational family patterns or not. Yeah, but we haven't. Um, yeah. Lots of stuff, lots of cool questions. <laughs> yeah. Um, it's getting close to one, and I imagine, I know you have to be somewhere at one-ish, so I'm going to just stop the stream for now, but Eduardo had a question. Maybe you can just jump in. Well, and I just wanted to say hi to Jane. She's hiding there. I see <laughs> we're down to so few people. I can see her now. <laughs> hi. <laughs> well, I, I, mean, I do. I can't help it. I come from it that from a ground squirrel that gets eaten by everything. And so I just keep thinking of this predation thing. I, why are they social? Just because they eat the same stuff? Um, well, I think more that, that it's, if you if you try to leave, right, there's no guarantee you're going to find a place to settle, right? Yeah. They're food for everything. You're right. I mean, like ground squirrels, right? They're food for everything. So, yeah. yeah. Sorry. Okay. No, no, no. It's good sure. to see you. Yeah. <laughs> to quote Nancy, they were potato chips. Yes. Yes. Um, so, Eduardo, I'm going to stop the live stream and then we can just chat, jump right in. So, again, thanks, Eileen, for a great talk and an awesome discussion yeah. today. Thanks. Uh, yeah, it's been fun. Next week, we got Joan Silk coming and <laughs> people.